So if we want to be happier, we really want to focus on others. And what can we give? How can we contribute? And in the beginning, it might be opening the door for somebody else. In the beginning, it might be smiling at someone else. It might be these simple acts of kindness. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of It Takes Grit. I had the honor and privilege of being on this fabulous lady's podcast the other week, and uh, now she's coming on mine. So, Anna, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We were just talking about the long weekend and how like the four days in our lifestyle felt like uh, like two weeks. <laughs> it totally did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone just like checks out. Fourth of July, they're not in. And then like Friday was a write-off because everybody's struggling from the fourth. And then everyone's like, well, it's Saturday and Sunday now. So, so what's the point? So I love it. Fourth yeah. of July has been my new holiday because I'm from England. So we don't celebrate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's nice though, because in America we work, 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 but Fourth of July people really, you know, enjoy, which is nice. I feel like it's the biggest, your biggest holiday. I feel like it's bigger than Christmas, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's summertime. Oh, the fireworks, it's, all, it's fun. It's mm -hmm. a fun time. That's awesome. Okay, well, I want to introduce you to my audience and my followers. So can you, can you tell them, like, who are you? You're a badass, but, like, give them everything. Like, really just sell you. Just be you. Be, be the badass that you are. All right, all right. Well, I'm from the Maryland, Washington, D.C. area. I grew up here, and I grew up playing competitive tennis. So I went to a tennis camp with a friend when I was about nine years old, and I hit a ball, and the coach said, whoa, do that again, and I did it again, and he called my mom, and said, you have a tennis player in your hands. And that really was um, a moment for me that changed my life. It was, I was nine years old and I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but I started playing tournaments. And I actually, the first tournament I played, I lost every round. And this coach, I heard a lot of the time, I had a lot of potential. And this coach told my mom that um, I needed to work on the mental game. And we were like, uh, what's the mental game? <laughs> so, um, I continued to practice and play and I worked on my mind and I started to win quite a bit. So um, I played competitive tennis all the way up until I went to college. I went to Penn State. So I played tennis there. Um, but I always struggled a little bit. I shouldn't say always. I struggled on and off with the mental game. And I saw a sports psychologist and I learned a lot of mental training techniques like visualization and focusing techniques. And then I entered the real world after I graduated college with my degree in psychology. And I, the only thing I really knew was playing tennis. So my first job, I moved to New York City, big dreams, by myself, didn't have any connections. And I started teaching at the tennis club there. And I noticed something interesting because I could see that people had, especially adults, had this potential. Like they would start to swing and then they would have this thought of, oh no, what if I hit the ball out? And they would stop. And the follow through actually keeps the ball in. So I started playing with these mental concepts that I had learned on my journey and applying them to these players that I was coaching. And it was amazing because they started to relax, follow through, you know, give them the breath. You know, when you exhale, when you hit, when, if you've ever played tennis before, you want to exhale. That's why you hear a lot of tennis players grunt, right? That's the exhale. So um, that was really my first op eye-opening experience to really understanding that that was really my passion to coach more on the mental game than the actual physical game. And plus, it was something that I was challenged with. So I had um, read a lot and received a lot through coaches um, on, on mind training. So that was kind of the first spark, but the path wasn't always pretty. <laughs> so as I started my journey in, um, you know, exploring life coaching, I, I stumbled a bit along the way because I knew I had to have a job to, to, you know, to be able to pay my rent in New York City is not the cheapest place in the world. So, um, you know, I always had these odds and ends jobs, but I approached jobs after I stopped playing tennis or, or actually not stopped playing tennis, stopped teaching tennis. Um, I had these odds and end jobs to try to learn and really um, learn how to start my own business. 
So I, I got jobs with the, I approached the job market with the understanding of one day I want to have my own business. So what are all the skills that I need to learn? Online marketing, sales. So I had, a, I had jobs in all different industries until I hit a point where I was fed up working for somebody else and it became a turning point because I had planted enough seeds in my own business on the side that I was able to make the transition to having my own business and I've been doing it for 10 years. That's, um, that's so awesome. And what I absolutely loved is when I was looking through our notes of this call, you were talking about visualize, visualization. And literally two days before you sent me that email, one of my customers messaged me and said, hey, I'm really struggling with visualization. Is there anybody I can follow? And I was like, oh my goodness. Like, and it's a very specific thing that like a client is typically asking for like, Hey, I'm, do you know, have someone with visualization? And I'm like, yes, like literally she's coming on the podcast. And, um, and so I just love sometimes how the universe aligns and she was literally visualizing that. And, and there you are. Um, <laughs> well, this is really cool about tennis. I love tennis. I was um, a ball girl for the, in England before they have Wimbledon. Okay. Women's tournament in a place called Eastbourne. And I was a ball girl, so I got to uh, meet a lot of the tennis players and I got to really understand the game. And when I go on vacation, if there's a tennis court there, that is my release. I don't like to play a match. I just like to hit the ball really, really freaking hard. Like that's, I'm like, don't, I don't want to play a match. It's not competitive. I just need to hit it. <laughs> so it's really cool because Wimbledon is happening right now. And did you, how far did you go with the tennis? Like, did you, were you traveling? Were you doing tournaments? Were you going pro? Yeah. So I was top hundred in the country and I was number one in Maryland, which was the state that I grew up with, uh, grew up in. And, um, I was seven in the mid Atlantic region. So, um, I played division one varsity tennis and that was, I didn't, I didn't play pro, but, um, I've always had a love for tennis and sport, and it's really shaped a lot of who I am. I think, you know, the discipline, the, fo the ability to focus, and, and sometimes I want to say even be, I don't want to say self-critical, but be able to really self-reflect, really, and say, okay, what am I doing well? Where do I need to adjust? And learning also, like, grit, right? Learning from loss, I learned a lot from loss, how to get back up, be resilient. And I think that's helped me a lot in my life and business. Mm. Yeah, that's so true. So when did you decide that, hey, I'm not going to keep going with the tennis, I'm going to be a coach? Or was it just like a natural thing that was like, that's just not where I'm aligned right now? Yeah, well, I knew I didn't want to be on the court seven days a week at all hours a day. That lifestyle just wasn't really what I wanted. Um, you know, the, it, it was also pretty exhausting. And I think I just got burnt out physically from it because I was hustling hard when I went to New York. I mean, you know, I had to build my business from scratch there. So I made myself available from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. all days of the week. And my friends were kind of having this nine to five lifestyle. And here I was like, you know, going out partying with them and then waking up and it's just a couple hours later and going, going to play tennis. And I thought, this isn't how I want to live. Um, and so I had, my, my dad is actually a therapist and he gave me a book on life coaching because he had studied it. And that, that, was, that was a moment that really it clicked. It was like, I read that book and I was like, this in my heart of hearts is, is what I really love to do. But not only that, it's also the lifestyle that I wanted to, to live. You know, speaking of visualization, I had this vision of, working from home, having the freedom and flexibility to have a family and be there with my, my child. Um, you know, I wanted to have that lifestyle. I, I didn't want to have this nine to five lifestyle. It was never really for me. So, um, you know, I tried it for a little while, but ultimately I knew that, and I knew I wanted to give back. I knew I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. That was something that was really important to me as well. So it was a moment, that it, I felt like it was a series of moments that qu clicked. But that book, I don't know if anybody's had that experience where you read a book and you're just like, ah, this, you know, it really resonates with your heart. Have you had that experience? I have. I really have. You're like, oh, this is a wake up call. This is what I'm meant to do or this is what I'm not meant to do. Yes. Yeah. How old were you and what was the book? 
I was 24 and the book was Coactive Coaching. Okay. It's a, it's a great book. I mean, it really looks at, you do, there's a lot of personal inventory in there. So um, a lot of good coaching skills, but also a good, a lot of good self-reflection tools in there. So from I think it's one of the best books. You were like, okay, this is my purpose. It's to help other people and then apply what you learn from the discipline of tennis you know, and that visualization to, to help other people. So what kind of clients do you have? Yeah. So I actually started to bring those tools that I learned from tennis and from the life coaching book into create my life and business. Right. So I started to visualize, like, for example, what does success look like for me? Right. Um, and that was part of, you know, I wanted to service, the majority of my clients are women in their 20s and 30s who are going through some life transition, primarily in, in their career, um, because they, they know that there's something more for them, but they're just not sure how to tap into that and figure out how to actually make it real. So, um, you know, I... I, you know, I say that like I had that aha moment, but it wasn't that easy to get there. You know, transitions are not typically smooth. They're typically quite messy. So I really like to support people in that, in that process. And also I think that we're all here ultimately to give our gifts. And a lot of the times we overlook our gifts or we have these limiting beliefs around how much we can give. Um, I once had this client, she she was in a job in finance and she was struggling and she wasn't happy. And, and she reached out to me and we started working together. And she was like, you know, Anna, um, we were talking about what do you love to do in your free time? Right. And she's like, I love to do makeup. So I was like, oh, that's great. You know, what if you were to do makeup? You know, and she was like, I don't want to be somebody who stands in a department store and put makeup on someone. I was like, well, it doesn't have to look like that, right? She's like, and she thought it was shallow too. She had a lot of limiting beliefs around it, right? She thought, oh, it's shallow, make somebody look pretty. But then we talked about, well, when people feel better, how do they behave, right? And when, and when they feel better, they're, they're kinder, they're nicer, and that has a larger impact, right? So we connected it to this bigger purpose for her. And she started to see, and we started to map out what success looks like for her. Well, now this was several years ago. She, she's <laughs> traveling around the world. She has her own makeup business. Um, she's, she also gives back. She helps women who, um, who, who undergo cancer and chemo. And they, she will go to the hospital and do makeup just in her free time. But she's also created a lifestyle for her where she makes lots of money. She travels the world. She does what she loves. She works with some of her work has been on billboards and Times Square for Dolce & Gabbana. So sometimes, you know, it takes one little insight or you realize that you have this limiting belief around what you think it, it's going to look like that you can change with the help of somebody else often because we stay in our, we typically recycle through the same thoughts in our own head. So, yeah, that's so true. And it's, and we kind of touch upon that about talking about ego, like recognizing that your ego, it doesn't interfere with your decisions because quite it, you, you just kind of mapped that out for that, that, that girl, that woman who was like, hey, this is a, a feeling kind of shallow. And sometimes allowing somebody else's judgment to get in the way of what you really want to do. So I find a lot of my clients sometimes get in a funk and that they have um, an idea of what they want to do in the future or they have a business idea or, or they want to implement it, but they're in a funk. How do you help your clients when they're in that, their life, they feel it's going in shatters, it's not working? Like, how do you start to even visualize things going great when you feel so crap? <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes a great starting point can be what you don't like, right? Because it's so easy for the mind to focus on what you don't like. We actually have a negativity bias in our brains because we're wired for survival. So we actually pick up negative information faster than positive information to keep us safe, right? It has a purpose. But what can happen is that we actually start believing these thoughts and we think that we're stuck or we believe that we're stuck or, or we have too much going on. So we wanna be first aware of the negative inner dialogue, but we can also say, okay, let's get really tangible and say, okay, what is it that I don't like in my life right now? right? And it seems like maybe that's a little bit negative, but you can use that as a catalyst for what it is that you do want, right? If you don't like running around all day, maybe 
you want to, you know, be at a job where you're more sedentary, you know, um, or if you don't like that, you, um, the, a lot of the times we talk about the environment in, you know, and that's really big when you're visualizing what kind, what kind of environment do you see yourself in? What do you see yourself wearing? Right? So you can say, okay, like, you know, I, these are things I don't like about my environment. These are things I would like about my environment. So you can literally write it down, make a list of the things that you don't like and change it into what it is that you do want and then visualize it. I mean, it sounds, you know, we, do, we actually do this quite naturally. In fact, we habitually imagine things we don't want all the time, right? We're, you know, the example you gave, people are typically using their imagination in the wrong direction, right? They're imagining things that they don't want or things going wrong or why they can't have what they want. And you just want to redirect your imagination. We're doing it all the time. You don't actually have to sit there and close your eyes. You could be in the car and you can imagine yourself being in the car that you really desire, right? And you really feel that feeling, right? So it can be little moments where you learn to tap into you know, if you're in the kitchen and you're, you're cooking, imagine being in the kitchen that you want to be in, you mm-hmm. know? Redirecting your imagination. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Ima- imagination is, I think, one of the most powerful tools. Everything that we have comes from imagination first. It all starts with, you know, this water bottle. Somebody once thought of a water bottle. And then, you know, through the the execution of it, people make it real, but it all starts with imagination. Yeah. And, and so when people are in a funk, it's like write down the things that you don't love right now about what you're doing. Like maybe it's the people that you're hanging around with. Maybe it's the way that you're starting your day. Like maybe it's the, the lack of exercise that you're doing and then just eliminate those, right? Just change it. Yeah. Re- redirect your focus. Your focus is, is really your power, right? And we're living in a world where things are just trying to grab our attention and focus. So if you don't gain power of what you choose to focus on, because what's wrong is always available and so is what's right. And so it's a choice, you know, and I know it, it can be oversimplified and I'm not to say, not saying like you're never going to get in a funk again or that funks are wrong. Sometimes funks are information. They're like, hey, wake up. This isn't, you know, this isn't what you really want. Pay attention here. So you can use those little nudges as redirection. Mm-hmm. Cool. That's going to be so helpful because I know so many of my clients, like, what do I do in a funk? And it's like, you know, you know, you're supposed to get out of it. And sometimes you wallow in it. You allow it to happen. And then, and then you kind of go down this circle and you really do have a choice. I feel it too. I know when I'm in a funk because I'm like, oh, you feel off. You feel different. And it's like, okay, you need to make the steps to change uh, so that you can visualize what you want your life to be like. So one thing that I um, I'm terrible at is meditation. So I'm going (laughs) to, a lot of us are, and I think it's because I don't know how to do it. I don't know where to start. So you're a big advocate for this. What is your, what are your tips? Yeah. Well, I love that you said that you're not really good at meditation because a lot of people aren't and including myself because we don't don't really practice it. You know, Um, I have a four-year-old son and I take him to meditation class And it is so incredibly challenging for him to just sit still, let me tell you. I mean, um, it's challenging. It's not really how we, um, you know, we're not, we're, we're kind of wired to keep going and to figure things out and to go get, right, to some capacity. It's not really that natural to be like, okay, let me just sit there and watch my thoughts. It's actually really challenging. And the idea is not to have no thoughts. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about meditation is that people think that they're going to sit down and they're going to be really peaceful and calm and they're going to have no thoughts and all they sit down and it's like, you need to do this. And there's all this mind chatter and they're spinning around. They're like, this isn't peaceful at all. And they just get up and leave, right? The whole purpose behind meditation is to be able to be able to recognize a thought and not let the thought but not let the thought make you take action on the thought. So that's where the true freedom lies in the choice that we were just talking about. So when you meditate, you might be able to sit down and let's say you meditate for five minutes and let's say you're in your home, right? This is quite common. It's actually very difficult to meditate in your home because 
your mind starts going, I need to do this. And, oh, I forgot to do the laundry and I need to, you know, and it's a constant to do, but what you're training in is not following the mind chatter and you actually gain control of being able to redirect that redirection that we're talking about. So I think the, the, the idea is not to be good at it, but to learn to relax. And eventually, if you do it long enough, you'll, you'll be able to notice a sense of peace. And the amazing thing is, is that you'll realize you don't actually have to create peace. Peace is already there. It's really a process of letting go and letting those thoughts, you know, like a bird flying in the sky that leaves no trail. You let the thoughts go. You know, so you might have this thought, that, oh, I'm not good enough, or I can't do that. And normally you might react to that thought. But in meditation, you practice hearing that thought, but not reacting to that thought. Because so many of us are living on autopilot. And a lot of the thoughts that we have aren't even our own. And about 85% of our thoughts are, ne are negative, and 90% are the same, same ones we had the day before. So we really are not in control. And it's a really a process to gain control. And you know what? It does get easier. <laughs> and I want to take away the idea of like the idea to get good at it. Sometimes you might just notice like, wow, my mind is really out of control. You know, other times you might notice that you're peaceful. But over time, if you do it, repetition um, is the mother of all skills. So I really um, encourage meditation because I think it allows you to take your power back and be able to um, take control, more control of your life. So it's, it's taking control and also letting go at the same kind of time. How long do you meditate for? Is it once a day in the morning, evening? Like what's the best start? What's a starter kit for a person <laughs> interested in doing some meditation? Yeah. Well, everybody's schedule is a little bit different. So I would I just want to encourage you to, to try it for five minutes. Set a timer, listen to an app. Um, I do a lot of guided meditation. I really like guided meditation. Um, you know, there's, I use YouTube sometimes, you know, we have unlimited resources right now. You know, if you're listening to this, you have access to unlimited resources, really. Um, so really I would say it depends on your schedule. I meditate around 10 30, 11 AM for me that works, you know? Um, so some people like to, sometimes I also put on a meditation to go to sleep just for fun. I don't really like do it to, as like a serious meditation, but um, I've dived, I started meditating around seven years ago when I felt like I accomplished a, a lot of my visions and my goals. And I realized that I just didn't have that sense of contentment that I really wanted. And that's when meditation really entered in, into my life. And um, what I've learned is that really from that neg negativity bias and that constant, even if you achieve a lot, I find a lot of high achievers can actually be quite negative towards themselves and critical. You know, can, we can be on this never ending cycle of never enough, right? And you can, you can even just practice listening to your breath. You know, I mean, it's so basic, but that's what makes it so challenging. <laughs> I think that's the thing. It's like Shavasana at the end of a yoga class is I get up and leave. I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> I've done my exercise. I don't need to lie down. Like, I'm good. Um, but yeah, and, and that's the hardest position is Shavasana because you've got to like switch off. And I'm like, I got to do notes and I need to write stuff down. Um, so do you feel like this helps manage like some stress and anxiety? Oh, definitely. I mean, there is so much research on the benefits of meditation and how it reduces stress and anxiety. Um, you know, I think that we're, we're, living in a world where it's hard, it's becoming almost harder in some ways to listen to ourselves because there's so much coming at us. I mean, we have advertisement all the time. Um, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, it's great because you're, you've con consciously chosen what you're going to put in your mind, what input you're going to get. Um, so, you know, the news can be very stressful for people. I mean, you look at those images, you know, I've sometimes advised clients to turn off the news for a week or two and see how your stress and anxiety goes down. You know, um, often when we're stressed, our, our breath becomes short and meditation through listening, you can learn to see if, okay, is the in-breath in, in as even as the out-breath, right? So you can start to pay attention to these 
stress responses that we normally have. And you can actually learn to, um, to actually retrain your body to respond instead of react to certain um, stimuli. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I watched this documentary, I think it was Dr. Sanjay Gupta from CNN. He did this documentary on stress and anxiety. And because technology is moving so fast, you know, there, there, that creates a lot of uncertainty. And stress is often, we want something to be different. So we're trying to control it, right? And with meditation, the only real control we can have is over ourselves, really, right? In the end, right? So it gives you, it gives you that ability to, to, instead of focusing on the external, all those things that you can't control and all the uncertainties and the things that might make you anxious, to really saying, okay, I'm safe here in this moment. And that's where your true power lies, is, is in this moment. And the choices that you make in this moment, little by little, shape your destiny. So even if, you know, I want to say like, even if you're maybe like, okay, Anna, that sounds great, but like, I'm not going to meditate. I'm just not going to do it. Try to, try to practice what I call um, taking in the good. So if you notice a moment that maybe you're driving in your car and you're really enjoying the song, take it in and really absorb it for 10 or 15 extra seconds. Or if you're in an exercise class and you're really feeling good and your energy's going, like really take note and really absorb that moment. And you'll actually start to rewire your brain and with new neural pathways because you're combating that negativity bias because it's those that that negative information is stickier than positive but if you start to train in taking in the good you literally start to rewire your brain so there's many different ways that you can approach you know meditation doesn't have to be so formal although i i do formal meditation you know people listening to this podcast might already be meditating. They might be intimidated by it. Either way, it's like there's little things that you can do to just practice in priming your brain to create more inner peace um, in a world that is just so, I want to say, <laughs> intense. <laughs> intense and crazy. It is, it is recognizing those moments when you feel really good. I had, I had two moments over the weekend. I never listen to the morning news. Like, I don't listen to the news. And for some reason on Friday, I put it on. Like I haven't listened to the news in years and it was traumatic. And I was like, I got scared and I'm hearing about these car crashes. And, and I, it's not me being naive to what's going on. Like I know that, but I didn't want to start my day feeling like that. And I recognized that this is like negative energy that I'm putting in. And then on Saturday, I went to a soul cycle class with a friend and I hadn't done that for like two years either. And in the middle of it, I go, I really love how I'm feeling right now. I need more of this. Mm. And it's recognizing those things that are, and visualizing those things that are making you feel good, doing more of those and doing less of the things that make you not feel good, which seems so simple, but it's actually really difficult because yeah. sometimes you don't recognize it. Yeah, it's awareness and it's, it's a lot of also self-awareness. You know, so it's paying attention to when does your energy go up and when does it start to dip a little bit? Oh, I just hung out with that person and afterwards I felt my energy dip a little bit. Or I just went to a soul cycle class and my energy went up. And you can kind of use that as a map to, to navigate. Mm -hmm. So it's not making like these big rash decisions all the time, you know, it's these little things. Yeah, because that's not even a big thing. Like, oh, I feel really good when I'm like doing Soul Cycle, and I don't feel that great when I'm watching the news. And it, it is, it's being aware of that. And I think that these podcasts are great to wake people up to just having that sense. Because I feel like we do, we go through this life, it's intense, and everything just merges in together. And we're never like being aware of like what we're actually feeding our body and what we're, what, what's making us feel good and what, what's not. What do you what do you do to help your clients with visualization? Like, you know, I've got people that watch my show that are maybe starting new businesses. They might be in network marketing. Uh, they might be pivoting in their life. Like, how do you even start to visualize and, and believe that it's going to happen? Because I think that's the biggest thing. It's like having a dream, believing it. What's the point of even visualizing it if it's not even going to happen? Yeah, well, 
you know, we, we think in words and in images, right? So it's really accessing the, the, the part of your brain that focuses on sight, right? And it's not just sight. It's actually all your senses. So you want to bring in, you know, your eyes. What, is it, what does it look like? You want to bring in what would you be hearing, right? So maybe people would be saying to you, oh, you know, you have such a great workout video, you want to bring in those, you know, what would you be smelling? Maybe the air is cool and fresh and, um, you know, how would it taste? How does success taste for you? So you want to bring into, in, in your, in your senses, right? What, what does it feel like? Right. Um, and then, you know, the mind doesn't know the difference between what's false and what's true. It believes whatever you put into it. Right. So, I mean, we've all had the experience of making up this whole story of, oh, no, something wrong is going to go happen, is going to happen. And then we feel anxiety because the mind th actually is believing that. So when it comes to belief, a belief is just something that you've repeated so much that now you believe it to be true. So it requires mental rehearsal. It's not like you visualize something once. And then you never visualize it again. You know, I, I won the Maryland State Tennis Championship tournament and I had visualized myself and mentally rehearsed myself winning that so many times. You know, I visualized during the day before I went to sleep at night, many weeks in advance that when I got there, it was like my body just knew. So it's not like you just go, okay, there's my vision. Let me just walk away from it. Or I created a vision board and I never look at it. You have to, you have to remind yourself over and over and feed your brain these, these ideas so that it, you can absorb with it. I like to also use the term as you mix your mind with it. Almost like, you know, if you put salad dressing in a salad and you mix it around, you really want to mix your mind with this vision and you keep mixing it over and over and over again. You know, see yourself walking into that meeting. What are you wearing? Who are you talking to? How are you talking? You know, really visualize it and, and feel it, you know, so it's, it's repetitive. You want to repeat it. And your brain in the beginning might not believe it, but you can still visualize it. And if you visualize it enough, eventually it will believe it. And it's having fun daydreaming about that and making that daydream become so real. Um, I, I've had, you know, dreams and things that I visualize and I'll drive in the car and I'll put a song on you know, that's the song that I'm going to walk up to stage to, you know, that's the song where my parents are going to see me win this award or something. And I will get emotional because you can feel it. You're like, wow, I'm going to feel so incredible. And when you're emotionally connected to that, it's very hard to move away because you want it so much and you want, you want it in real life. You want the realness. Yeah, what, you, what you've done with those songs is you actually create a trigger. So I love music. Music can definitely be triggers. And, you know, you mentioned earlier when people are in funks, music is a great tool to trigger you to change your state, right? And the other thing you mentioned is that, um, you know, that you, you seeing yourself doing it, you get the emotional connection. That's really what drives us that emotional connection. And I've had the experience of visualizing and, and then I start crying because I'm like, Oh my God, I got, I got the thing I wanted, <laughs> you know? So yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's an incredible tool. And, um, it, we have access to it all the time, you know? <laughs> It's a powerful thing. And it really is. You have to train your brain at the beginning. It's like, uh, I don't know about this. Like, I don't even see it for myself. But like, if you really want something enough, you know, you, you do want to put in the time to, to daydream and think about it and visualize if it's something that you really want. Do you feel like if it's not someone someone really wants that they're that that's why they're not visualizing it or getting stuck and they might need to really train their purpose. Like it, it might not be what they, they think that's what they want, but actually it's not. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it comes back to also once again, self-awareness, but I think that we have, I think that we know what, what our inner visions are. Sometimes we're, maybe we have fear or doubt. It, those are natural obstacles along the way. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't have your vision, 
right? Just because you, you have fear or doubt, like sometimes that's just when we have, when we're going through or we, we present change to our brain, it's natural for some fear to arise because any type of tra- change, it does trigger a little bit of that survival mechanism in our brain. So it's, a, it's just to be more aware of like, okay, there's some fear there that like, okay, I might be really afraid to have this relationship, but I, I still really have the vision and I can visualize myself. You could even visualize yourself working through the fear of saying, okay, you know, high fear. You never want to push fear down or away or pretend that you don't have it. You want to acknowledge it, welcome it, say hi to it and keep going, right? Very, very gently, gracefully. Um, so yeah, I think that um, it, it's normal and natural to have some fear. And I just want to say it's, it's not hokey pokey stuff, you know, daydreaming, visualization. It's, it's grounded in a lot of science. They've actually done a lot of research with athletes. They've done studies with uh, basketball players where one group, they were shooting free throws and the other group just visualized themselves shooting free throws. And actually the, the group that just visualized themselves performed better because they never saw themselves miss. So what, they, what registered in their brain was success over and over and over again, and they actually had a better performance. So it's not hokey pokey. They, you know, they've been using it with athletes for years. Um, you know, there's a lot of science and research behind visualization as well. So, yeah. Absolutely, because even just in, the, in Wimbledon right now, Coco Goff, who's 15 years old, mm-hmm. she had to visualize beating, you know, Venus Williams. Like, and you can tell with her parents and how her mindset is when she's being interviewed that she's not just gone and walked up to Wimbledon and gone, oh, I'll just give it my best shot. She has in her head visualized what it's going to be like to win the final. I, I'm sure that like that's some of the mindset that her coaches and, and all athletes are doing, like the women's final. You know, the, you're, you know, the, the USA women won yesterday. And the captain, I can, I, can, I can see how she visualized that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, even Sarah Blakely, who created Spanx, um, she's one of my favorite entrepreneurs. She just wrote a post on Facebook that was something about like how she still works on her mindset, how, you know, how she said something about being an athlete, like you have to work on your, your physicality, but also your mindset. And, and in a business, you really have to work a lot on your, your mindset. So yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think that it, like once you achieve a vision that you then stop either, right? You learn how to use these tools and um, it might feel funny at first, you know, it might feel a little bit silly. Um, I remember before I got, um, maybe I'm not sure if I was single at the time or I just met my now husband, but I got, I bought this like fake, um, like engagement looking ring. And I used to walk around my apartment. I didn't wear it outside the house, but I used to walk around my apartment just feeling what it would feel like to be engaged and, and look down at my hands and, and really absorb that feeling. And it was definitely new and different and it felt a little silly because anything new is going to feel a little bit like, oh, this is, this is new, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, but I, it, it also brings out a level of playfulness that's really important too, is that, you know, we want to, sometimes we can take our lives so seriously, you know, um, but it's important to, to play. So um, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's manifesting. I, I have a girl, it's funny that you talk about the ring and you, you manifest whatever's in your life right now. Like if you're in a toxic relationship, like you, you allow that, you manifested that to come in because that's where your negative thoughts were, were happening. And one of my girlfriends, she literally wrote down to the T of the guy that she was looking for to, he didn't drink, he had a kid, he was, he's, he's been married for like all of the, like very specific things. And she would wear like her outfit for the day. She'd be like in a yellow dress and she would look into the mirror and she'd be like, Hey honey, if you see me today, I'm wearing a yellow dress, like come up and say hi. And like, she started this visualization and this manifesting like, this actual man and like he came and they've been together for a year and a half and you're like, okay, there's gotta be something to it. Even though it sounds 
kooky and weird <laughs> and crazy. Like, just do it anyway, just in case, you know, it's like, why not do it? <laughs> yeah, totally. You might as well. It's not going to hurt you. That's yeah. for sure. Exactly. And, it's gonna, and then it's going to just make you feel better and give you good energy into your own soul because you know exactly what you're looking for. And then you're not going to settle. If you keep re, you know, rethinking the things that you want in your brain, those things that might come in that are not going to serve you, you're like not even going to entertain it because you've so wired your brain of what you do want. This is like, you know, it's the opposite. It's like trying to like a food that you've never liked before. Um, it's not going to come in. And so when does it switch to being about you to being about the purpose and actually other people? Because when I got healthy, I thought for the beginning it was for myself because I'd suffered with anorexia and I didn't eat food and I had lack of energy and it was for me. And I didn't know that it was going to turn into this. It's got nothing to do with me anymore. It's got everything to do with people I'm helping. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that because I do think... I do think initially it can be like, I need, to, I need to solve this because I need to get healthier in whatever, whatever area of health that is, whether it's your finance, whether it's your relationship, whether it's your food and exercise. Uh, the initial intention might be for you, and that's important. It's, it, it plays an important role because um, if you're just giving from a place of emptiness, you're not going to be really able to give that much, right? Or you're giving from a place of resentment or, or, you know, might turn into resentment, right? So you don't want to just like overlook yourself and pretend that like, I'm not important. Um, but the idea eventually becomes once you've had some healing there. So initially it might be for yourself is that that's ultimately not going to serve your greater good, right? Because, in it, because if we, if we really check, Every time we're suffering, who are we thinking about? Ourselves, right? In the most obsessive way. Every time you're suffering, guaranteed, and I know this from my own experience, when, I was, when I'm suffering, I'm thinking about myself in an obsessive way and not in a way that's helpful to anyone, especially myself, right? So if we want to be happier, we really want to focus on others and what can we give? How can we contribute? And in the beginning, it might be opening the door for somebody else. In the beginning, it might be smiling at someone else. It might be these simple acts of kindness. And what happens with these acts of kindness is it actually increases, um, you have a burst of oxytocin, the feel-good horm hormone. And what happens is that the person who receives the kind act, they get a burst also. And anyone who witnesses a kind act they, they, their serotonin and oxytocin increases as well. So it really has a, these kind acts really has a ripple effect. And I think that ultimately why we're here is to really, to make the world a better place. So when we focus and we put our intention on what value can I offer versus I have nothing to give. So if you want to start a business and you're like, I'm not good enough, you know, that's all about you. Right. But if you start to think, how can I help somebody? You know what? Maybe this exercise video can really help somebody. You know, you're, you're as a result, naturally, your happiness will increase. It's not like you set out to be happy. It's like you, you help others. And as a result, your happiness increases. So oftentimes our purpose can be actually areas of that we've struggled in and things that we've been able to overcome the pain points that now we've learned how to heal them within ourselves and they become the gifts that we can give to others. So I do think it's really important to have this, you know, it's not, it's not to be a doormat and to not think about yourself and just do for others all the time, but you take care of yourself so that you can give to others, right? Mm -hmm. The healthier you are, the more that you can give. The happier, happier you are, the more that you can give. And also, if, you, you know, if you're not feeling happy, be, be kind to somebody else. That can help you. you know? It's so. directing that attention instead of yes. on you. And you might be playing the victim mentality to actually helping somebody else. Like, hey, I'm not the victim. Let's see like, what I can do for someone else. It's so interesting because you know, a lot of times we start businesses or we start things for ourselves. And as soon as we switch over to it, helping other people, we get better because we become the coach. Like we, we become the, and then we get happier and we have a purpose and we're much more likely to continue at it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, ultimately, the more that we can contri- contribute, the more that we get, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, so it's, 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 it's also what you said is where you put your attention. So a lot of people, you know, we want to get certain things. That's natural. We have desire and there's, there's, there's nothing wrong inherently with desire, but ultimately if your desire is to help others, you're actually going to receive even more naturally. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's almost just like coming from a place of how can I serve? What can I contribute? It just feels better. I think too. Yeah. And it's having that authentic happiness because, you know, one of your points, you talk about like checking the boxes doesn't make you happy. And I'm, I'm terrible at that. I'm like, okay, like once I've done this, like I'm going to feel this. And I've had times in my life where, you know, a new version of my apps come out or something and the buildup has been exciting. And then it happens and I'm like, why don't I feel anything? And it's like, how do we, how do we make sure that we're not just ticking boxes? Yeah. Well, you know, the process of creation is a lot of actually where the joy is. And that's where we actually want to focus more on process than result. So it's not that the result isn't important and there's nothing wrong with checking boxes, but often it doesn't actually give us the result that we want. So you want to focus more on the process of creation. When we're creating, we feel good. And so I like to use creation instead of planning. So you have the vision and then what, do you, what, what can you do to create it? There's actually a tangible, practical aspect to the vision. So you want to have the vision, but then you actually want to think about tangible actions of creation. And, you know, we, we often think that the result is going to give us a certain feeling and then we get let down. You know, um, I've, had, I've had people who launch their website initially and they like think that initially there's going to be like, you know, people running, knocking on their doors and there's not because we kind of set it up in our our heads where we think that once we launch something that it stops there, but that's actually where it begins, right? It's just a different part of creation. So as much as, as, as much as you can, I like to say that the, the goal is really to enjoy. That's really the goal, right? We think our goals are like to, to buy a house and you can have all of that, but if you don't practice enjoyment along the way, that thing that you get is never going to bring it to you. Mm-hmm. So how much can you enjoy? That's really the question that you want to be asking yourself is, okay, I know that I'm in, I want to get this result and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that, but enjoy, enjoy it. Enjoy the process because you know, when it, when it happens, you're going to look back and be like, oh, like I did all this, but I didn't even, I didn't even get to enjoy it. And, and I think that that's a big thing that I really learn is like, you're right. The, the creation of it for me now is the most exciting because that's putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, you know, like that's building, that's the ups and the downs. And when it happens, that's just the direct reflection of like the enjoyment and the fun that you, you can have as you're actually building it. So that's amazing. Well, I am just like, you've helped me so much. Like, I love all of this. Like, you've given me so many ideas about what I want to do and the whole visualization thing um, I know is going to help so many of my audience and members. And just that list of taking the negative things that aren't serving you, writing them down, and just moving away from it and and, and putting that visualization into the positives. Because we do, we daydream like crazy bad stuff. Like, why does our brain do that? Last question. Why do you, why do you think that we, we are naturally go to the negative? Well, it just goes back to survival. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I wish I had a fancier answer, but it's really just because we're, we're, you know, we needed that type of brain many, many years ago when we had actual, you know, threats. Now we're perceiving tigers that aren't really there, you know? <laughs> so we think, you know, we can feel threatened by what somebody else says to us. Whereas, you know, there's nothing actually really inherently, um, you know, wrong with what somebody says, but our interpretation of it. But we're just, we're just constantly trying to protect ourselves to keep ourselves safe. So we just need to be aware that that's what we're doing and not to take it everything so literal. Um, Don't take your thoughts so seriously. Not every don't believe every thought that you think, because a lot of the time they're not true. And it's something that you've been picked up from somebody else. So Create your own thoughts about how how you want to be and who you really are, and connect with with that truth. 
Yeah, it's like you're trying to survive as the person thousands of years ago. We're not the same people anymore. So it actually doesn't make any sense to even protect ourselves because there isn't any tigers or bears or anything around. So, but, but knowing that we were programmed for that, I think it's going to help a lot of people now to be like, oh, that is why I go to the negative. Because like that was a person, a human being thousands of years ago who needed to have that skill set, but we just haven't evolved to get rid of it. And now... Yeah. It's like, you know, you take things so personally and like you get offended by things, but really it's, it's just something that's manifested because our time and our technology is like gone to a whole other level. Yeah. And just to put it practically speaking, like, you know, if you're like, I don't get it, you know, <laughs> why would I be in this relationship that, you know, I keep, I keep feeling bad. Right. And recycling negative thoughts on it. Well, you might, you might actually be scared to, for something new. To, to leave the tribe, to do something different, right? There's a lot of threats, perceived threats to leave a tribe, right? So, um, you know, sometimes there can be those, those roots deep down in there, but um, we're always going to be a little bit afraid of change, but if we can just recognize it and not be, be, the, be the fear, but rather see the fear and move through it. Um, a client once said this really nice. He said, um, you know, I recognize that there was fear, but I wasn't afraid. Mm. So. Yeah, that's so true. Love it. Okay, well, where can my audience find you? Tell me all your social handles and, and all of your things. Yeah, so you can find me at annagoldstein.com. And I also have a p podcast, which is Profit With Purpose. And my Instagram is Self in the City. Love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I know that I already know, I already have people in my head that are going to benefit so much from this. So I really appreciate it. Um, and guys, thank you for watching and listening to um, It Takes Grit. Make sure that you leave us a review uh, or just go and follow the It Takes Grit podcast. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram, Rebecca Louise Fitness. Guys, have a great day and we'll see you next week. Bye guys.